For many of us, the concept of health is defined as absence of disease. But do you really believe that to be true? As a specialist surgeon and teacher, I have come to the firm belief that true health is a balanced state between the mind, the body and the soul. Under the Knife with Dr. Arun is an attempt to tap into the wisdom of world experts from various fields to learn practical tools that can allow us to change our own destiny. Not just in the field of health and wellness, rather in every facet of a fulfilled life. But it begins with health. Because as Emerson said, health is our first wealth, the value of which is only recognized when it is lost. Join me in welcoming another global expert in this episode as we explore some amazing self-empowering ideas today. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Under the Knife with Dr. Arun. I'm your host, Dr. Arun Deer. I'm a surgeon, I'm an author, and more importantly, I love the opportunity to be able to bring amazing guests on the show such that we get the opportunity to tap into their wisdom and put their years and decades of experience and what they have learned as their life lessons into our own life. Now, today I have a very special guest, and he is none other than the famous Michael Yardney. Michael is best known as the property expert of Australia, and he's also Australia's leading expert of the psychology of success and wealth creation. In fact, he was recently voted one of Australia's 50 top influential thought leaders. And I'm so privileged to have Michael because I've followed Michael's work for over a decade myself. I read his books when I was wanting to get into property investing. But, you know, uh, as, as things happen, everything happens for a reason. I got to know Michael personally. And today I'm here interviewing you, Michael. I'm so, I'm so privileged, I'm honored, and I thank you for your time uh, that you can share with me and my audience on this interview. No, it's my honor and I'm looking forward to our chat, Arun. Beautiful. So, Michael, I think uh, I can talk a lot more about your achievements and all of that. But I think the best thing that I've found that comes out is when we start delving into the the actual core stuff. And I tell you why I thought of interviewing you for my show, even though I'm a medical practitioner and my forte is health and well-being. I truly believe health is your first wealth. If you don't have health, I don't care what your bank balance is like, you're never going to be able to enjoy it. And I'm sure you and I agree on this. Of course, of course. Without a doubt. But what I have also noticed is that wealth also creates health. So it's a two way stream. It's not that health is the, oh, you can be healthy and you can be poor and everything is fine. I think you need a balance on both sides. And that's where I thought you would be such an amazing person to share your thoughts with our audience on how the two are going to be correlated. So can I just ask you, Michael, can you share with us what has been your journey like so far? Tell me about the Michael who was young, starting out, and maybe had a lot of fear and doubt. Well, I came to Australia at the age of three. My parents came uh, because they were told it was a land of opportunity. They were both hard workers, and I came went to school here and i i didn't have pocket money to buy lunches like some of my friends did uh my parents friends uh went on holidays at christmas time and and, and we didn't and my parents didn't have my sister till um eight years after i was born because as migrants they couldn't afford to have another child but over the years i saw my friends parents um who happened to be my parents' friends, and they had cars and they went on vacation and they lived a different lifestyle to us. And I wanted to be like them. And I learned over time that they owned their own businesses. My parents were employees. I learned that they owned investment property and real estate. So as a young age, I wanted to be like them and I guess get out of the the rat race. So my parents taught me a lot of very good habits, but maybe not the best money habits. But I had, I guess, that like that rich habits, uh, rich dad, poor dad story. Yeah, <laughs> I, I had good examples and mentors from other people, and I wanted to aspire to be the same. 
So you could start seeing, you were appreciating the contrast between people who were wealthy and people who were not wealthy. And I think it's got to do with the mindset. And I think I was coming to that with your book that you have written with Tom Corley, which is Rich Habits and Poor Habits. And can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to write that book? Because you are into wealth creation through property investing. Well, a lot of people ask me, what makes some people successful property investors uh, and the average investor never gets past one or two properties? And in my mind, it has a lot to do with mindset. You said a moment ago, and I agree with you, that, that how many properties you own or how big your business or share portfolio is, isn't a sign of wealth. I believe your true wealth is what you're left with when you lose it all. It's your health, it's your relationships, it's your spirituality, it's your ability to keep growing. Um, but, but, there was a lot of books on where to buy the next property or the next hotspot or how to invest in shares or save tax. But Tom Corley, my co-author, did a five-year study of the rich and the wealthy and the average clients in his CPA practice. And I had mentored over 15 years, close to 3,000 successful and not so successful property investors. And we found a lot of similarities and there are some hints, there are some habits, there are some clues. So I saw as part of my responsibility as I had uh, become successful uh, in many areas of my life to pass it on to others. And that was the thought process behind Rich Habits, Poor Habits, which has now been translated into multiple languages, uh, Chinese, Malayan, Korean, Vietnamese, Polish, um, uh, and as well as being successful in America and the United Kingdom and Australia. So for somebody who almost failed high school English, I'm an international best-selling author. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I think that is that is the amazing part of it that, you know, when you change that, you know, as Jim Rohn says that, you know, don't, uh, even if you change the direction of your trajectory by one degree, you don't know where you are going to land in mm -hmm. 10 years, you know, so just change the direction. Don't worry about about making a total change overnight. Yes. But uh, Michael, can I ask you, if, just for the benefit of the listener, are there any three top habits out of that book that you could share with the audience that what really makes a difference in an individual's wealth earning capacity? Well, maybe not just from the book, but from my experience in general. I think on your own, you can run faster, but uh, as a team, you can get further. So I've always had mentors. I've had business coaches and I've had mentors. Well, not always. In fact, when I first started off, I had too much of an ego and I thought I could do it all on my own. <laughs> the world has a way of bringing your ego down and bringing you I down know. to earth again, doesn't it? Smacking um, you on your knees. But once you... Once I, in 2006, got my first business coach, uh, grew my business, but also I still have mentors today in various elements of my life. So get some good mentors. But I think the other lesson from that is be careful who you listen to because mm. everyone's got an opinion, but that doesn't mean you should take their advice. And I believe you should only take advice from somebody whose shoes you'd be prepared to swap and be in their, their position. Uh, so be careful about that. That's step one. Uh, I've heard you say that multiple mm. times, and I think that's so true. But can I ask you, what are the five levels of wealth that you talk about in your books? You know, what are they and why does it matter so much? Well, I, I think it's important to understand that your financial life is a journey. And most of us hope to work the way up the financial ladder so we can enjoy more freedom, more choices in life. And I realize that wealth is a hierarchy. So when I've dealt with clients over the time, and it's not a judge of people, uh, but there's a pyramid and very few people make it to the top. But when you understand where you are in the hierarchy, you then know what you need to do to move uh, further. So as I said, while money is important in certain areas of your life, it's of no benefit in other areas of your life, as you said, with health. However, the problem is uh, when you have money, you actually can solve a lot of problems. And one of the comments I've made in my book is uh, that any problem that money can solve isn't a problem. So yeah, uh, when my air conditioning blew up a short while ago, I, I just rang up Grant and came and fixed it straight away. And didn't bother me but for other people to spend a couple of thousand dollars fixing an air conditioning unit would would, would be a big problem so money gets rid of some problems clearly yeah. and not others uh 
But the financial challenges I think a lot of people experienced over COVID reminded us that the rich are getting richer and the gap between the rich and the average Australian is only widening. And so I think it's important to understand the five levels of wealth. I'm sorry, it's a long, complicated answer because most people think, hey, we're all in the middle. It's a, a sort of a uniform thing with a few rich people and a few poor people, but we're mm. all in the middle. No, that's not how Australia mm. is at all. Yeah. And each stage you've got to work your way up. <clears throat> so, excuse me, level zero, I guess, is financial instability. Most Australians still, unfortunately, live mm. from paycheck to paycheck. Now, I don't know we get a paycheck anymore. It comes in our uh, yeah. account straight away. Yeah. But in my mind, they're financially unstable. Or on, <clears> they lose <throat> their job or they have an emergency or an illness or their car breaks down. They don't have reserves to cope. And, yeah, and the yeah. current situation with rise of cost of living and inflation, it's making it harder. So how can they handle unexpected burdens that life dishes out if they've got no spare financial capacity. Not so in my free. mind, as I said, they're financially unstable. And mm. the only way out is they borrow more and they get yeah. further in debt. And this only creates more financial hardship. And so the cycle goes on. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And I think I've, I've often said that there are these seven pillars of a fulfilled life. Starts with physical health, then mental health spiritual health but a big part of that is your financial health mm. because if that is upset and in fact they did a study through the harvard medical school and what they found was that income of the individual was a big predictor of their overall health and well-being but it was mm. not exponential mm. it was not that you know you keep earning more and more and you keep getting more and more health and and uh, mental health and physical there is a point where there is a sweet spot Mm. And the funny thing was they found the sweet spot was about 150,000 per year of Aussie dollars. If you equate yeah, yeah, yeah. Aussie dollars, which is not a lot of money. If you think about it, it's not a lot of money, but they said that's the sweet spot. So, mm. I mean, it sometimes brings into question how much money do we need yeah. to say that we are wealthy? And would you have anything to shed light on that? Well, let's, go, let's keep working up the financial ladder because you asked me a question, so I'm going to answer it. So the first level, level zero of the five steps is actually financial instability. Yes. And you've got to understand where you are because you then got to learn what to do to get to the next level. So the next level in my mind is financial stability, level one. And to reach this, which is really a most basic level of wealth, you accumulated sufficient liquid assets, maybe some savings, money in a line of credit to cover your current living expenses for, let's say, a minimum of six months. You've got private medical insurance, you've got some life insurance, you've got some backups and protection in case you get sick, you get ill, you get disabled. Uh, but when you attain this level of financial stability, which is sort of what you're talking about, Arun, you've got the comfort of knowing that should any unexpected changes occur, come your way, your family's lifestyle won't be unduly compromised. You've got adequate time to look for new sources of income to get back on track. So level zero, you're unstable. Level one, you're stable. Level two is financial security. Now you've actually accumulated sufficient assets to generate enough passive income to cover your most basic expenses. You know, in other words, you'd be able to, you've got some assets, whether it's your share portfolio, your property portfolio, not your super, which is where a lot of people have got their assets because you haven't got access to it. But these assets would cover your mortgage, your home-related expenses, your tax payments, your grocery bills. So this is actually a level of financial security that I think most Australians, most people around the Western world want to achieve. So when you achieve that, Aaron, you can stop working and you can maintain, I guess, a simple, a basic mm. lifestyle. Mm. Now, Spark Property Investors can achieve that by growing a property portfolio, but that takes 15, 20 years. It's not a, a get-rich-quick scheme, and nor is yeah. investing in shares. Then the next level up, level three, is financial freedom. That's where you're free. To, you've got accumulated assets that give sufficient income, generate enough income to pay for the lifestyle you desire, not just the current lifestyle, which yes. is the level below, but the one you desire with all the expenses without ever having to work again. You're a successful investor, which means you don't have to go to work, but you can make the choice whether you want to or not. Yeah. And to be blunt, I don't have to and haven't for a long time needed to go to work. And, you know, mm -hmm. running a business of 80-something people, some, there are problems. That's, they always come to the boss, uh, the problems, they reach the top. 
and occasionally I've thought, is it worth all the trouble? But I'm still working because I want to, because I have fun doing it, because I've got nothing better to do, because I have got a level of financial freedom. And then there's the last level, which is what I'd call financial abundance. A small group of sophisticated investors get this level uh, where, where the portfolio portfolio works overtime. They're free of financial pressures. They've got so much surplus income after paying their lifestyle. Uh, the asset base just keeps growing. And so I believe people listening to this who want to climb to the top of the ladder, first of all, I think you've got to decide to become wealthy. You know, that, that sounds weird. People say, but of course I want to. But no, they actually don't. They're, they're actually, you can see in their decisions what they do with their life, how they spend their money, that they're not, that uh, they haven't made the full decision. Then invest in your financial education. Don't wait till you know it all. Then just get yourself into the property or share world or whatever your investment technique is. Not crypto, that's speculation. But surround yourself with like-minded people. Uh, and, and then just understand that it's a long-term journey Aaron. now that's that's a great sort of you know you've given a summary of what you've probably talked about in the book i haven't read the book but i can understand that where you're coming from on the five levels of wealth now being a medical practitioner i'm going to just turn the table a little bit over here michael just yeah. for the benefit of the audience so that they get a perspective from both aspects there is a health aspect and there is a wealth aspect now i come across a lot of patients who are wealthy in their financial sense. I come across them from time to time, whether it's their uh, academic educations or it's their bank balance. But what I also start to notice is, Michael, that they are getting burnt out in other areas, all right? And the bigger question that comes up is, how much is enough? Yes. Now, now I'll tell you that it's great to have an amazing financial portfolio that pays you a passive income, that makes you financial independence great. But I also know that it takes courage, effort, and going through a lot of uncertainty for a period of time to reach that stage. You have gone through that. I've read your journey, I've heard your journey and the uncertainties and all of that. And for some people, their ability to handle that stress uncertainty is not as much. I understand that is a muscle that builds over time. So the bigger question then becomes is how much is enough? And how do you say to someone or what do you say to someone uh, that, you know, yes, they want to aspire for that financial, uh, you know, uh, affluent level, that uh, the level five that you described, but how do you know that you strike it in a balanced way? I guess you've got to know your why. Why do you actually want it? What are you after? And if it's to beat the guy next door and have a bigger, faster car than him or to the people on Instagram or TikTok to be better than them, you'll never be satisfied. So I believe to be truly wealthy, Arun, you also need to be grateful. And I know you practice gratitude and I do every morning when I get up as well. So one of my habits before I go to sleep every night when I put my head in the pillow is think of what has been good during the day. And I want to go to sleep with some good thoughts in my mind about, and, and you know, it's nothing to do with money and it's not the last deal. It's probably seeing my grandkids or my beautiful wife or my lovely dog or, or things that it experiences. And in the morning, I actually have to come up with some new things each day that I'm grateful for, because unless you're grateful, the extra car or the bigger portfolio or the money in the bank, it's not for you happy. We see so many yeah. miserable wealthy people well sorry they're not wealthy miserable rich people very yes. different. rich and wealthy are different <laughs> there is a difference between being wealthy and being rich yeah. and i think that's the point that you're trying to make that you know you can be rich in your bank account yeah. but you can't be wealthy unless you are actually having a heart full of gratitude yes and appreciation and that's so beautifully put it because i tell this to my patients when they are coming with health issues or they struggle with weight issues you're not just trying to be a number on the scale because that is a very shallow goal to have you just want to look beautiful in your pictures you actually want to live a fulfilled joyous life that's the goal. And I think that's so interrelated with what you and I are saying. That That's really well put. Now, if somebody was in a financial uh, sort of unstable situation, which is level zero based on your health scale or sorry, your wealth scale, how would you ask them that what can they start doing today after listening to this conversation to start getting a better handle on their finances, Michael? That's a good question because 
they probably blaming others. So I think the first reason is thing is to recognize what's happening, where you are, and why. And don't blame others. The poor think the rich have become lucky because they've robbed, raped, or pillaged because they've got tax dodges. <laughs> That's not the way the system works. Um, so basically, don't expect a different result unless you change. And it all has to do with your way of thinking. Uh, uh, if you keep doing the same thing, or keep thinking the same thing, you're not going to get a different result. Uh, to expect that is, is it's insanity. <laughs> So you've got to understand your money habits. So my book, Rich Habits, Poor Habits, is more about habits. And learn from people who've already achieved what you want, the results you already want. We've already spoken about that. So do you want to become fit? You go to a personal trainer. You do what they do. You eat what they think. But you also have to think how they think so you become like they become. This means if you hang around other people, rather than go to the pub at the end of the day and talk about football and complain about the boss, go home and listen to podcasts, watch a video like this, improve your financial intelligence. Um, you know, if you hang around bike riders uh, who wear Lycra, uh, you, you would end up being thinner like them and you'd ride your bike and you, you'd actually think like them. So learn the rules of money. Educate yourself because you probably haven't learned it because most of us have been taught by unwealthy people we've heard things we've seen things we've experienced things from our parents and michael just to add to that uh, sorry to interrupt that study that i was quoting just a while ago from the harvard thing they talked about income as a predictor of your health and the second thing was education the more educated you are, and a lot of us, as we know, we stop educating ourselves after our diplomas or university degree or whatever. We just say, you know what, this is it. And that is the biggest issue, I think. Well, one of the things we found in the Rich Habits study that's written up in Rich Habits, Poor Habits, the book, was that wealthy people read more every day. But they don't read to entertain themselves. Mm. They actually read to learn and educate and improve. They also have mentors. And I think the other lesson that you asked, what do you tell people who are currently in a difficult yes. situation, is to be realistic. Develop good money habits. And there's nothing new. Spend less than you earn, invest it, or save it, I apologise initially, and then invest it. That goes back to that book that I'm sure you've read also, The, old, the Richest Man in Babylon. It goes back yeah. centuries that the answer is there's no get-rich-quick scheme but just do it and then repeat it. And, and wealth is the transfer of money from the inpatient to the patient. That's a Warren Buffett quote, but it's true. That is absolutely true. And I think just to add to that, uh, I, I, my turning point was when I read this one quote which said, uh, leaders are readers. Yes. Now, if you're not reading, you can't be leading. And I, when I was transitioning from public work to private practice and running my own business, I knew I had to be a leader. I had to lead my team. Otherwise, I could see this could go down the hill. And I think what you've said also very important in that book, Richest Man in Babylon, and that's a great book, by the way, for anybody to read, uh, to just get started on the bigger picture concepts. But what that book says also, Michael, is about contribution. So even if you can contribute $1 out of $100 in any shape or form, I think that is a big... Do you want to just share something about... I know you run a charity, and I know you uh, you and your beautiful wife, they, they sort of do events and all that any thoughts on the role of contribution yes look i i think that uh, it's often said that you should tithe 10 percent of your income to give back to the community and i believe that's very important and we do it quietly but yes we do actually have a charity ball that pam's running again couldn't for a couple of years over covid and that's coming up <clears throat> it's going to be in brisbane uh, in uh, August 2023, but so you're planning it already now. So I think it's sort of important to contribute and give back. But I also believe it's important to contribute and tithe to yourself. So apart from investing, I think you should be investing 10% in yourself, in mentors, in coaches, in programs to improve. So not only helping the rest of the community, but it's your obligation to help yourself so that you can improve and be a better person too. 
Yeah. Michael, just a business related question, because um, you, you alluded to the mindset difference between an employee and somebody who is a business owner. One of the things that I often come across because I meet people from different walks of life, that as a business owner, you pay yourself the last. You, you kind of, you know, say, you know what, let me first pay the other responsibilities, other bills and all of that. Is there an issue with that that you see or did you come across anything or any comments? I would welcome your comments on this. Well, there is the thought that if you're trying to start saving and investing, what you've got to do is pay yourself first put money aside because that's what the tax man does. He knows at the end of the year, you're not going to have the money to pay your tax. So he takes the portion out every week uh, and, and it's much the same. So yes, if you, you pay yourself first and then spend what's left over while the poor habits of most people is you actually spend and, and save what's left over. That doesn't work. That's why most people never get wealthy as a business owner. It's a very different set of responsibilities. Some months businesses do well and you, you you take the surplus, but other times you've got to, as the owner's responsibility, pay the rents, pay the outgoings, pay your staff. Uh, so there's the ups and downs. But if you run your own business, and I'd encourage everybody to build a property investment business, then you've got to treat your investments like a business. Um, and in that particular case, pay yourself first. Uh, I've heard you say many times in your podcast as well that, you know, every property is like a business. It needs to put money in your pocket rather than take it away uh, from you. And that's that's not something that every investor thinks like initially, you know. Well, I'm not totally in agreement with that because there's different ways you make your money out of property. So some of it's capital growth, yes. some of it's tax returns, some of it's inflation, and some of it's the rental income. And well-located investment grade properties in general uh, if you borrow 80%, won't put cash in your pocket, but you've got to learn how to uh, service the debt. So that's having a finance strategy as well. But it's all got to be part of a bigger property investment strategy. And smart investors don't only buy properties, but they buy themselves time. In other words, they've got finance buffers in place to, to service the cash flow and service the ups and downs of the property market. Yeah. Michael, I see you not as, you know, I've listened to quite a few different property experts and all that. I see you, you stand apart from the crowd because of the, the topics that you touch upon, like the mindset matters. There are not many other people out there who are talking. What caused you to stand apart? Because you, 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 you are at a risk of, yes, uh, you know, getting the admiration of people for talking these things, but you're also at a risk of exposing yourself to more criticism. So right. uh, do, you, do you see that? Because I see myself in a similar situation to a conventional medical practitioner who wants to either prescribe or uh, do procedures, and that's it. I was very apprehensive when I started talking about mindset matters relating to the health of my patients. Well, it's more than mindset because... There's in Australia the tall poppy syndrome where if I own more properties or I drive a nicer car or I live in a better street, people are going to want to knock you down. Now, interestingly, as we mentioned a few times, I've co-authored Rich Habits, Poor Habits, one of the nine books I've written with Tom Corley, who's from New Jersey in the United States. And when I discussed this tall poppy syndrome, he said, what? He didn't even, overseas, they didn't have this concept. Yeah. In America, he says, if people are doing well, people respect them as, uh, and aspire to get there rather than to pull them down. And that's one of the habits of wealthy people. They actually encourage others to be wealthy. They're not mm. just because I can own a, a, a property doesn't stop you from doing it. Just because I've got a nice car doesn't stop you from getting it in this country we live in. So, mm. yes, you're right. Putting yourself out there does potentially expose you. And boy, have I got a lot of trolls on my YouTube channel that I have fun with um, just <laughs> bantering because they, they believe the world is unfair. And that's one of the challenges of one of the poor habits compared to the rich habits. The poor people blame others while the wealthy people take responsibility. Mm -hmm. I am where I am for all the decisions I've chosen to make mm -hmm. and those I've chosen not to make. Yeah. And I believe to be wealthy, you actually have to feel you're the pilot of your life, not just a passenger going along for a journey. And as a medical practitioner, you'd understand that psychologists say the more you feel in control, 
the, the better you are, the less stressed you are. In fact, there is this very famous German study that has been done, which actually talks about the locus of control. Yes. People who have an internal locus of control are more empowered. They feel more self-esteem, more confidence that they are not in being controlled by external circumstances. Whereas people who have an external locus of control feel that life is being done to them. Yes. So it's a difference in perspective and you are absolutely spot on. I think just building that conversation on in terms of, you know, I know a lot of listeners in the current times may be pretty skeptical about inflation and, you know, stresses. And we know that stress affects not only your mental health, but also your physical health. And it creates a lot of doubt and procrastination. Is there anything that you can suggest to people who are uh, going through all these conflicting, you know, conflicting news in the media and everywhere? What can they do to start actually getting their composure and starting their wealth creation journey? What I have found is that we seem to be much more stressed at the moment, partly related to you and I both live in Melbourne where we had lockdown a couple of years ago, seven lockdowns, I think it was, <laughs> uh, 260 days. But COVID's over. But despite that, there are side effects of ta hassles, stress, concern. And at the moment, then there's political unrest, geopolitical unrest and wars, inflation. The media loves this. There's it stores is. of real estate Armageddon. Because the media's job is not to educate you. The media's job is in one way to entertain you, but not really. The media's job is to get your eyes on the pages that it already has sold to its advertisers. And it knows that of all the thoughts we have most of the day, about 80% of them tend to be negative. And so for that reason, it plays on that uh, because we, we're more likely to click on those sort of things. So be careful again who you listen to. They like to sensationalize it, right? Of course they do. Now, it's easier for me because I have the perspective of having lived through inflation, but mm -hmm. the first recession I lived through, well, I, I, we, we had downturns and recessions in the 70s and 80s, and I was investing then, but the media wasn't as prominent it wasn't the 24 7 mm. news cycle so i didn't know much about it and there was very long delays in the news cycle the mm. first one i came across was the the very difficult recession we had to have in the 90s when in victoria uh, there, there was uh, one business going broke after the other and property investors going down and i had some strong financial challenges as well but i i, I got through and it was very scary at the time. It was there anything specific, much, Michael, much, just on that time when you were so uncertain? Is there anything specific you did during that really uncertain time to get you through that challenge? Other than worry? Probably uh, yes, not. Other than worry? <laughs> because, again, it was the first time I went through that. And yeah. so I guess it's easier now, having been through a number of ups and downs, a number mm -hmm. of cycles, I have a different perspective. Mm -hmm. So I can understand why people like you who've been investing for a long time in business and me who's done it even longer now for close exactly. to five decades, it actually is less concerning because I am an optimist. Mm -hmm. I think I'm a realist, but I am an optimist because I believe that spring follows winter every year and summer follows spring. And I'm going to put my money on the fact that we're going to get through all this. Mm -hmm. um, am I realistic? Yeah. Um, do I believe there's going to be challenging times? Definitely. Mm -hmm. But I'm an optimist. And by being optimistic, well, I actually don't know any wealthy, rich pessimists. So yeah, that's a good way to put don't, it. Don't fight the odds. Yeah. And believe that the take a long term perspective yeah. and believe that the fundamentals, the fundamentals don't change. Mm -hmm. Things change a little bit. Yeah. But not and the as they say, you know, this too shall pass. And, well, uh, the wise King Solomon, I was told, I read, actually had it inscribed in his ring that he was never too arrogant during the boom times or too despondent during the challenging times. This yeah. too shall pass. Correct. Correct. So coming back to the original question, what do you suggest to someone looking or hearing about all of this news in the media today to ignore it and still start progressing? How do they start? Well, the answer is you can't ignore it because you shouldn't put your head in the sand, but you've got to be careful who you 
believe, and I think we're over the worst with regard to the the inflation is still going to rise till the end of 2022. And then most people are going to realise, hey, that's it. Interest rates are going to go up once or twice more since we're recording this in October uh, mm. 2022. And then it's going to slow down and the world will move on again. So have a long-term perspective uh, and don't try and make short-term um, quick decisions. In fact, don't make 30-year decisions based on the last 30 minutes of news. Much easier to say when you've been around the block a few times, though, Aaron. Yeah, that that's so true. And I think uh, in terms of, you know, uh, talking about the uncertainty, some sort of uncertainty will always persist in anybody's life, whether it is global factors, local factors, or your personal factors. That will never go away. There are always reasons not to invest. Over the years, uh, yeah. there have been problems right from all the 50 years I've invested. In, in, in fact, every year there's an X factor. I learned this from, um, in the old days, there was a magazine called Business Review Weekly, and um, Don Stammers used to write an article about that every year, picking what the X factor was, and then uh, it became the financial review that bought that. Yes, yes. But every year, despite all the best laid plans, Things go wrong. COVID. Yeah. No. COVID. The, war, the war in Ukraine and Russia um, yeah. that caused <clears throat> inflation. Or, or you go back every year, there were geopolitical problems. There were local problems, some for the upside and some for the downside. So there's always an X factor. So while I believe it's important to plan, you've also got to plan for your plan not to go to plan and not get too put off by it because yeah. that's the way the world works. In fact, the way I've come to learn it, Michael, is that, you know, nobody knows what's going to happen the next minute. All these fund managers, hedge fund managers, property, anybody, you know, and I've got a lot of respect for them for all the work that they've put in but they don't know what's going to happen like in fact there was this joke that was going around in a late 2019 you know when the new year hit uh, and 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 then nobody knew about covid and they said there you go there's your 12 month goal people like to set their 12 month goals in january and yep. everybody's goal <laughs> went pear shaped yes so that is it. Now, Michael, I know we've, we're having a lovely conversation, but what I wanted to ask you was that what has inspired you to go from property investing, business owning to now writing books? Because I see that that's a transition in your journey and you are helping through your books and through your podcasts, other people to get wealthy as well. Uh, and I know we spoke about the tall poppy syndrome, but what has inspired you to go on this journey and, and, and choose to work on your terms? Well, I get paid, my company gets paid, our team and my co-directors get paid by high net worth people giving them advice and even beginning investors giving strategic property advice, helping them buy properties, managing their properties. But not everybody can be a client and I'm not going to be able to help everybody either. So I believe it's my obligation now that I have become successful to pass the information on the 50 years of experience in a $30 book. Uh, and in fact, you don't even have to pay $30 for the book. Every day uh, we have tens of thousands of people read my daily property update magazine, uh, email, e newsletter, mm -hmm. uh, 150,000 downloads a month of the Michael Yardney podcast. I actually enjoy giving back. And interestingly, the most fun times are when somebody comes up to me and says, hey, I've read your book and it's mm -hmm. changed my life. A couple of weeks ago, Pam and I were at a concert, a musician's concert of, um, it was Ross Wilson from Daddy Cool from when I was a young boy, yeah, a teenager. Yeah. We went to see him and we were sitting there uh, waiting for the show to start and somebody came up to me and wow. he said, are you Michael Yardney? Yes, sorry, do you mind if I have a quick talk with you? He said, thank you so much. You've helped me so much. That made me feel really good. Oh, that's so nice. The most interesting time that ever happened was a number of years ago when we were in China and we were in the hotel in Beijing at breakfast in um, uh, the Waldorf Astoria, a very beautiful hotel. And right. the waiter came up to me, the busboy was giving bre serving breakfast and said, are you Michael Yardney? Wow. Well, what's going on? Yeah, he's seen, <laughs> yeah, he seen it from the- You're the, a star the, in the, China. <laughs> the room key, you know, he, the, 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 he's, you know, he's seen who, who's got the room. But when he actually then talked about my books and blog, then it actually, uh, it actually changed things differently. And I, I realised, no, 
he actually so that makes me while I help other yeah. people, there's a selfish element to it as well, an oh. ego element. I actually it makes me feel good. It's like the universe giving you feedback, right? Yeah. That whatever you're doing, you're doing it on the right track. You know, you are on the right track, you know, mm. keep doing more of it, you know. Mm. And that is the real fulfillment. And I think when I see patients walk in and they say, you know, you've changed my life, uh, they get promotions in, at their work because they are now able to do things. They've got more energy. It just brings a level of joy which can't be expressed in words, you know. Michael, I know we are coming to the end of this uh, interview and I'm so grateful for your time. Uh, I have a tradition of asking three questions uh, to my in, in my guests. Uh, they, these are questions that are really of pertinent value to my audience and it taps into your wisdom of ears. And yes, you and I have been talking about it. So if you allow me, there are these three questions that I want to ask you. The first one is, what is your one success habit that if of all the habits that you may have developed over the course of, you know, your lifetime, what is the one habit that you would say has really contributed to your success? And I kind of know the answer to it, but yeah. Okay, so, well, the continual learning and educating and reading. So. so I actually haven't read a full book for a long time. I did recently, but I read and scan books, but every day I spend hours learning from people about things i already believe in, but yeah, I yeah. also read things that are contrary to my way of thinking because mm. I never want to end up with confirmation bias where I only follow the thought patterns that I've already got because Google makes that too easy. Yeah. If you do a search on a particular thing, you're going to keep finding things and websites coming up based on what you already wanted to believe, and that's where many people make a mistake and they discard information that doesn't fit in with their preconceived ideas. In fact, there was an article just on that confirmation bias thing. It said that, you know, there are now so many studies that are now available, scientific studies that have been published. You can prove or disprove the same point based on the strength of a study that you can find on Google. So that's really amazing. You know, Isn't so that you, interesting? Yes. You, you have to challenge yourself. That is so true. The second question, Michael, that I have is, what are your three truths of wisdom? If all your books and your podcasts and everything was taken away from you today, it was it just disappeared, you know? And if, if you had to pass these three truths to your son or your grandkids or whoever it may be, your loved one, what would those three pieces of wisdom be? I guess the first one is dream big and you are able to do whatever you choose to do that doesn't mean it'll be easy it doesn't mean you're going to just be able to do it and be prepared for failure along the way i'm a real success at failure i've failed in all areas of my life but i've gotten up one more time mm -hmm. so the other bit of wisdom is really that be prepared for failure and don't let it stop you nor letting what other people say you can or can't do stop you because you're always going to have critics you're always going to have people telling you that's not possible um i guess the other one is to keep learning and having mm. mentors to help you grow to the next level it's impertinent to think you can do it on your own that's so true that's so true and michael last question is what do you think is your legacy going to be of course you've written amazing books you've touched so many lives and you are already sort of you know whichever country you go to people are you like they just want to hang out with you they just want to acknowledge you for the work and i do that from the bottom of my heart too what do you think is your legacy going to be interesting yeah the books and the fact that i've helped a lot of people have helped uh, I think is an important one. My book, uh, How to Grow Multi-Million Dollar Prop, I can't even say it after all these years. Multi-Million Dollars, <laughs> yes, from in your spare time. time uh, which was my first book, is probably Australia's top-selling property book and is on the bookshelf of most successful property investors. So uh, I'm very proud of that. But I don't think, I think probably the legacy would be my children because it's not what you leave them. And I hope to leave them a substantial property portfolio. It's what you leave in them that's mm, important. That's and I'm sense. actually very proud of my grandchildren who are beautiful people. And I'm so proud that my kids have become good parents yeah. to actually bring up such lovely grandchildren. 
Yeah, it's not just about what the prop having a property portfolio, but what it does to your way of behavior and all of that. Michael, I hope I've been a good role model for them. Oh, absolutely, you have. You know, and there is the so many feedbacks and and the the testaments that you get. You know, for your, the work that you do, are clearly sort of you know an evidence of that. So. Michael, I want to take this time to actually thank you from the bottom of my heart. I acknowledge you for the ongoing work that you do and the time that you spend in educating others, because from your wisdom, you know, we are learning so much through your books, through your podcasts. Where can people find your uh, book, Rich Habits, Poor Habits? Because I know of your podcast, most of the people can just search your name and find that. Well, the easiest place is to go to Michael Yardney Books dot com dot au michael yardney books dot com dot you would just do a google search we'll put it in, the show notes as in well. the michael yardney books there'll be ability to buy all my books and you can get them from bookshops you can definitely get them online uh we, we will post them out to you uh, and most people today get the kindle version don't they and they they Correct. read it on, on their iPad. i'm a little bit old-fashioned i love holding a piece of uh, book and a paper in my hand and i like to underline as well so uh well, but i understand people have their own options you know and and i think i I would highly encourage everyone who is listening to this interview to subscribe to Michael's uh, podcast. There is a wealth of knowledge. And what I really love is in that podcast, the piece that you have on uh, the mindset nugget that you give, you know, towards the end. I always finish it off at the end. And interestingly, that's the, despite it being a property and money and success podcast, yes. is the most commonly mentioned thing, not just you, that other people think the same. <laughs> so I think we there was a question you asked a while ago, and I tend to ramble, where why am I different to the others? Others will tell you how to buy or what to do or what to invest in. But to me, I, I think the psychology of success is critical and the appreciation of wealth is critical. And I think that's what's made, as you correctly say, made me different to the others, but something I'm proud of. Yeah, why not? And absolutely, as you should be. Michael, thank you so much once again for all your time. I really appreciate this. And I look forward to, you know, sharing with you how this podcast and uh, interview went. My pleasure.